الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقتة من لسان يفقه قولي إن شاء الله we'll continue with the second session of this contemporary laws of zakat we have both the online and the on-site participants and uh, last week we discussed uh, the importance of zakat in light of the Quran and the ahadith we looked at the definition of zakat the conditions for zakat the recipients of zakat so we, we touched on a lot of the technical aspects of uh, zakat in light of the Quran the ahadith who is eligible to receive uh, zakat etc it's fine yeah, you know, the noise it's you can hear? Yeah, okay. So inshallah today we'll be covering a lot more of the technical aspects uh, of contemporary issues with regards to zakat and uh, particularly for the benefit of those people that are joining online or that will be watching later on you can go back to the part one of the session which is uploaded on YouTube as well and that will provide some of the the basics with regards to zakat, etc. So, we begin by talking about zakatable assets. Which assets are subject to zakat? Not all assets are subject to zakat. The most important thing is that the assets that are subject to zakat, they are stipulated from the side of sharia. So, it's not something that we choose of our own accord. The zakat payer has to have complete ownership of those uh, of those assets that ownership must be tam the ownership must be unrestricted so sometimes you might have a situation whereby your asset is pledged as security and there's no control or benefit then in that situation those assets are not subject to zakat so sometimes a person might have a bank account that's been pledged as security one would need to look at whether the ownership or the benefit and control is in the hands of the owner of that uh, a person that owns those assets. So the ownership needs to be unrestricted and there must be an opportunity for those accounts or that money to grow. So typically you will have a situation of money that is paid as a deposit. For example, a person pays a rental deposit. So the question comes about as to whether that asset is subject to zakat or not. So if it is a non-refundable deposit and it has been given to the lessor and it will be set off against rental or it is a prepaid expense, sometimes we pay an ex expense in advance, then that asset is not subject to zakat because that has come out of our ownership, that has gone into the ownership of the counterparty. But if it is a refundable deposit, meaning you pay it to the lessor and at the end of the lease term he may refund it back to you, then that asset is subject to zakat. So you need to take that into account in your own personal zakat calculation. So it's important that we have that understanding of what assets are included. And inshallah, in tonight's presentation, we will cover that. So your typical zakatable assets, firstly, it's all forms of cash, anything that you have in cash and bank accounts, all gold and silver. So those are the only precious metals that are subject to zakat as gold and silver any assets that a person has purchased for resale so if you are in the business of selling anything whatever you are selling whether it be uh, uh, gold or silver or any other asset may, maybe the business of selling phones computers hardware uh, uh, even if it's a sideline or a side hustle all of that that you purchase as your articles of trade uh, or, your, or your stock for trade that is subject to zakat and this is important especially for home industries many people are involved in different types of home industries or side hustles and perhaps they have some stock maybe somebody is selling some clothing items somebody is selling some socks somebody is selling some t-shirts or different types of things if you have ownership of that stock on your zakat annual date then that stock is subject to zakat and we'll talk about the value but this asset would also be considered anything that you have purchased for resale. Any livestock and agricultural produce is also subject to zakat. But generally, we won't be going into the details of livestock and, 
and uh, agricultural produce because it's not as common. So I would suggest, of course, if you are a farmer or if you are a, uh, involved in agriculture, then uh, perhaps you can go and, and discuss with the ulama and, and look at the, the details of it. But we won't be covering the details of that. It's quite technical. It's quite complicated. The, the number of animals that you have to give zakat on, if, you know, for example, if you have five animals, you'll give so much, etc., etc. Then you have non-zakatable assets. So any assets of a personal nature, anything that you are using to live, your home, your car, those types of assets will not be included in your zakatable assets. So there's no zakat subject to that. Any assets that you have purchased not for resale. So let's take an example. You buy an investment property. You buy it as an investment property. Perhaps you're going to be renting it out, etc. Even though you're earning income on it, there's no zakat on it. But if you are a property dealer, you buy and sell properties, that's your business. So that property is now going to be considered a stock in trade and you will have to pay zakat on that. Interestingly, if you purchase an asset without an intention for resale, so let's look at that property again. You buy that asset for investment purposes. After two or three years, you decide, I want to sell this property. So even though you change your intention later on, that asset will not be zakatable because at the time you purchased the asset, it was not with the intention of resale. Including if you are in the situation whereby you buy the property, but you're not sure, maybe you're going to rent it out, maybe you're going to sell it. Even in that situation, ulama have explained that you will not pay zakat on it because your intention is not exclusively for resale. So this asset will not be subject to zakat. Okay, so if we go deeper into cash, and we talk about cash, what is included in cash and how do you calculate zakat on cash? So of course any physical cash that you have, whether it's under the mattress, whether it's in the safe, whether it's in your pocket, of course nowadays we don't have that much of cash, but any physical cash that you have, that is subject to zakat. Whether the cash is with you or whether the cash is sitting by somebody else kept as an amanat. Of course we spoke earlier on, if you have pledged it as security for a specific transaction, then the ruling is a little bit different but if you have any cash uh, uh, assets that are on you that is subject to zakat then of course we have nowadays cash in the bank account on our online platforms we have different uh, online accounts and cash is in those bank accounts so whatever cash is sitting in that account that is also subject to zakat any forex that you have whether that is in cash or whether it is sitting in the account that is also subject to zakat. So any foreign exchange, especially we go overseas, we come back, we have some riyals left over, some dollars left over. We need to accumulate that and we need to include that in our zakat calculation annually. Or for example, you might have a global account where you have some uh, funds sitting in there or you might have a cash passport account and you've got some funds sitting in there. Ultimately, as long as you are the owner of that foreign exchange, you are liable for zakat. Of course, when it comes to cash, we will look, uh, forex, sorry, we will look at the spot rate on the, on the date that your zakat is due. So if your zakat is due on the first of Ramadan, you'll go on to Google, you'll look at the Rand dollar exchange rate, the Rand real exchange rate, whatever it might be, and you'll note it down, and that is the value that you should be paying if you are paying your zakat in rands. Of course, if you have dollars, you can discharge your zakat in dollars as well. So I've got a thousand dollars right? Two and a half percent of that, $25. I can't discharge it in dollars. If you have somebody that you're able to give it out to in dollars, it's permissible to do that. But if you are converting everything into rands, which generally is the more practical way of doing it, you will then convert it at the spot rate on your particular zakat date. Now, before we move on to the, the, the cash uh, or after the cash, one important thing we must realize, particularly here in South Africa, is sometimes we have other entities that we have set up for estate planning purposes, for tax purposes. So for example, you might have a family trust, you might have a business trust. You need to determine who is the owner of the wealth that is sitting in that trust and zakat needs to be calculated. So you have a family trust with a bank account and there's a hundred thousand rand sitting in there. Who is the owner of that? Very often for tax purposes, we've created the trust but the individual himself, he is still the owner of those funds. So zakat needs to be taken out from those funds. Or if it is a trust and there are two or three beneficiaries and from a shari perspective, the beneficiaries have been made owners, meaning they can do whatever they wish with it. 
then they are responsible for discharging the zakat. The same applies with the company, the shareholders of the company. They are responsible for determining and paying their own zakat. So if two of us are partners in a business 50-50, we will have to work out the zakatable assets of the company. And at the end of the zakat year, I am liable for my 50%, you are liable for your 50%, which we should discharge from our own funds. Yes, if we come to an agreement that from the business funds we'll calculate zakat and we'll discharge it, then of course the obligation is taken away. So that is something that you will have to do on an individual basis. Okay, so then we move on to gold, silver and jewelry, right? When it comes to gold, silver and jewelry, the gold or silver, we will weigh that gold or sil silver. We're not looking at the market value of the gold or the silver jewelry, meaning you take it to the jeweler and he tells you this uh, uh, piece of jewelry because of the work, etc. involved, you know, it's valued at 100,000 rands. We have to look at the weight of the actual gold that is included in there and we exclude any other items like diamonds, uh, any other metals that are in there if, if it's able and possible for us to determine that value. Uh, we will obviously look at the commodity price and the currency exchange rate. So normally we look at the gold price on your zakat date. Gold is normally given out in uh, uh, dollars per ounce. So we'll need to convert that into grams and the jewelers can help you with that or you can go onto the internet or you can get a, a price of gold in, uh, in grams as well. And generally it's in dollars, so you'll have to convert that uh, at the spot rate. And we've got a worked example at the end, inshallah, where we'll cover that if we have some time. If we have gold-plated jewelry, gold-plated jewelry is not considered to be gold or silver for the purposes of zakat. It's an, uh, another metal that is underneath and it is simply plated with gold. Also, the principle here is it's not possible for us to extract the gold value or the gold item from a gold-plated jewelry. It's a coating that's, that's around the, the jewelry. So that will not be subject to zakat. However, if you have nine karat gold, nine karat gold, and there are differences of opinion on this, and many of the issues that we'll be covering today, there are differences of opinion from different senior ulama. So you look at that mufti that you have confidence in, and you choose that, that view. Of course, we may not go through every single view here today, uh, I will share some of the views where, where possible. But when it comes to gold, 9 karat gold, although the value of gold is less than 50%, it's only 37.5% of the, of the gold value in that, uh, in that piece of jewelry. But it is possible for a jeweler to extract that gold from there. Therefore, the ulama have mentioned that zakat is due on it and we should calculate the zakat on 9 karat gold as well. Of course, the higher carats, the 18, the 22 carats, we will also calculated. When it comes to a Kruger coin, here we will not use the weight of the coin and the price of gold, rather we will use the market value of the Kruger coin on the date that we have our zakat date. For example, today the value is around 36,200 rands for a Kruger coin. So when we value Kruger coins for zakat purposes, whether it's a quarter coin, whether it's a half a coin, whether it's a full coin, we will use the market value of the Kruger coin. Right, so we are moving quite quickly. Is the pace okay? We're moving quite quickly because we want to try and finish the session tonight, inshallah. Uh, we should be able to finish it. Now we come to stock in trade, inventory as it is called for accounting purposes. When it comes to inventory, what are we talking about? Anything that we have purchased for purposes of resale. So if it's in our business, of course, everything that we sell but it could be raw materials, it could be packaging, it could be the finished product. If we are in a manufacturing business, it could be work in progress where we've partially manufactured the item, so it's not completed at that point in time, right? And of course, if we have a small business on the side, then finished goods, whether it be clothing items, whether it be, uh, uh, you know, uh, different types of, of stock that we have, all of that that we have purchased for resale, that will be included in our zakat calculation. We have to value it annually on our zakat date. So this is the important part. What value do you use or when do you calculate the value? It will be the value, the market value on the date that you are calculating zakat. So if you're doing your personal zakat, sometimes it's not very difficult because you've got a small quantity of goods. But in a, in a large business, 
the valuation of stock is not a simple exercise. It's normally done, it's complicated. There may be provisions, etc., that are attached to it. So usually what businesses will do is they will use the financial year end date or the closest date available to their zakat date for the valuation of their stock. And normally, for zakat purposes, it's good if we carry out our annual or our monthly stock take on the date when it is our zakat date or as close as possible to our zakat date. So it's easy for us from a quantity perspective and from a value perspective to get the most accurate figure. This is very important because normally we, we carry out our stock takes based on what our audit requirements are or our year-end requirement. But we fail to realize that if we are paying zakat on our stock, we need to count our stock. It's a good opportunity for us to also check and count our stock and make sure that everything is in order. But we should try and do our stock take at the, as close as possible to our zakat value date. How do we value? What, what price will you use? for the purposes of stock. So the incorrect value is the cost price. You will not use the cost price of stock in trade for purposes of zakat valuation, right? You could use the market value, the selling price. For example, you buy a phone, the cost price is 10,000 rands. The market value of this phone, for example, is 25,000 rands. So you could use 25,000, that's probably the easiest for you to use. However, you, you may be paying a little bit extra zakat because what you could do is you could use a bulk sale price for all of your goods. Meaning that if I had to take all the goods in my business and I had to sell it in one go, how much would I get for this? Or in my home, if I have all different types of goods that I'm, I'm a, I've got a home business, I don't necessarily have to use the selling price that may be a little bit higher. For example, on the phone example, if I have to sell all my stock of phones, I may be able to sell it or somebody will say, I'll give you 20,000 Rand per phone. So that is the bulk sale price. So you could use the bulk sale price. If you're unable to calculate the bulk sale price, the next proxy would be the selling price of those goods. The cost price should not be used. Right? The cost price should not be used because the value of that good is not in the cost price. It is in actually in the sale price that you are going to be selling it for. Where we have a business, for example, we would exclude any transport costs or any other costs that may be added on for accounting purposes. We wouldn't include that for purposes of our costing valuation. Right? We have finished goods that are on hand as we, sp we spoke about it. We have work in progress. We have goods in transit, even damaged goods. Even if you have stock that is damaged, that needs to be valued for zakat purposes, even if the value is below cost price. So I've got this phone, it's now damaged. I can't sell it for 25,000. In fact, I can't even sell it for 10,000. But maybe I can trade it in at the Apple store for 5,000 rands. In that case, I will value this at 5,000 rands. So we have to attach a value unless, of course, the, the value of the stock really is uh, totally zero. But generally, it, it's unlikely that you would have it at, at zero. You may have some sort of a scrap value. So damaged stock also needs to be valued. <clears throat> Obviously, the bulk sale price is going to differ from industry to industry, and from retailer to wholesaler to manu manufacturer. A manufacturer's bulk sale price will be different to a wholesaler. A wholesaler normally has a markup. A retailer normally has a higher markup. And his bulk sale price will be different to the wholesaler. So we'll have to look at the industry that we're in and the type of uh, industry, whether we are a manufacturer, whether we are a wholesaler, whether we are a retailer. Where we have, and we, we spoke about this earlier, we have goods that we have purchased for personal use, and then later on we decide we're going to sell it. So I bought my phone, I'm using it for myself, and later on I decide I'm going to put it on the market. I don't need to include that into my zakat calculation because my intention at the time of purchase was not for resale. Now, it is preferable, according to some ulama and some of the international accounting, Islamic accounting standards, for our zakat to be paid in cash, right? However, it is permissible for us to pay our zakat in kind. It is permissible for us to pay our zakat from our stock, for example. It's also permissible for us to pay uh, you know, some obsolete stock that we have to give that out in zakat. But of course, the value of that stock is going to be lower. So we have to do a proper valuation. And we also should look at what is anfa'lil fuqara, what is most beneficial for the poor at that point in time. 
Perhaps we may be in a situation where uh, giving the zakat in kind is more beneficial to, the, to that particular poor person than if we have the, the ability and opportunity, rather than giving it in cash, we would give it in kind, but it is permissible both in kind and in cash. Both will be satisfactory from a zakat perspective. So these are just some aspects with regards to, to inventory and how we would uh, calculate the value of inventory. One uh, additional point that comes to mind for businesses here is you may have goods in transit. Perhaps you have purchased goods from China and at the time that you are now calculating your zakat on the first of Ramadan, those goods are somewhere on the water. The question arises, do you include those goods in your zakat calculation or not? So the principle here is whether you have the risks and rewards of ownership from a shari perspective. Do you have control of that stock? Are you able to do what you wish to do with that stock? For example, can you redirect that stock to be sold somewhere else? So do you have possession of that stock? It depends where the stock is in the journey. Sometimes while it is, it is on the water, you may not have control over it. The supplier still has control. But once it reaches the port, and perhaps your business is now in Johannesburg uh, or somewhere inland, while it's being transported, you actually have the control. You could have delivered it to Durban, but you decided, no, you know what, I'm going to deliver it uh, to Johannesburg. Or sometimes you have stock that is being moved from one location in your business to the other. So that also needs to be included from a goods in transit perspective. You would have to assess whether that good uh, is within your possession and you pay zakat accordingly on it. Okay, then we come to, to debtors. Now, when we talk about debtors, this means where somebody owes us money. Somebody owes us money and there are different categories from a shari perspective for zakat purposes as to whether we will have to pay zakat on this annually or not. The first category are trade debts. Debts that arise from trading items that we have sold. So in our business, we are in the business of selling cars, for example. The cars that we have sold, somebody is paying us after 30 days, after 60 days, after 90 days. Those are trade debts, right? Or if we have advanced monies on loan. I have given Brother Suleiman a loan of 100,000 rands. I've given him cash as a loan, right? Or if I give him loan of gold or silver. So, again, look here, these are all zakatable assets. We sold goods, the goods were zakatable assets. We gave money, money is a zakatable asset. We loaned gold or silver, also a zakatable asset, right? So, if I have got a debt arising from one of these three categories, then I have to pay zakat on that debt every year. So, when I sell my goods, for example, Bai Suleiman is owing me 100,000 rand for the goods that I have supplied to him. I will have to include the 100,000 Rand as a debt, as a debtor. I'm going to receive it, it's, it's a receivable to me. I will have to include that in my zakat calculation every year. So if he's owing it to me for five years, in year one, I'll include it. In year two, I'll include it. In year three, every year, I need to include it for as long as it is outstanding, right? With the exception that if this year he owed me 100,000 Rand, I'll have to include two and a half percent, that is two and a half thousand Rands. Next year, when I'm calculating my zakat on that particular loan, I will now calculate it on 100,000 minus the 2,500 that was zakatable the previous year, so 97,500. And now when I calculate, it will be 97,500 times 2.5%, so it will diminish over time. But the principle here is that I need to include this in my zakat calculation. I do have the option, if I have not received the money in cash, that I don't have to physically pay out the zakat until I receive that debt back. So physically I don't have to pay it, but I have to keep account for every year that it is due. And when I receive the cash, I can discharge the full amount of zakat. Obviously it's easier from an administrative perspective, rather pay it in the current year, even if the person hasn't paid me, and particularly in a business, it's easier to do that. But from a shari perspective, you do have the option, you will not be sinful for not paying physically in cash. But you need to accumulate, this year was 2,500, the next year was 2,400, whatever it is, until the time that uh, by Suleiman, he uh, uh, settles the, uh, uh, what you call it, the debt with me, then I can pay out that zakat. So that's the first category. 
The second category are non-trade debts. Debts that arise from the sale of items other than trading items. For example, you sold your house or you sold your personal car. Somebody owes you money, right? So the principle here is that you only have to pay zakat on that in the year that you receive it. When he pays it to you, in that year, you will pay zakat. You don't have to pay zakat for preceding years when that debt was still outstanding, unlike the first category. And then you have the third category where other types of debts, they are not the sale of trading items or non-trading items. There's no sale that has occurred. There's no loan of money or gold or silver. But it is a debt that's due to you, perhaps due to inheritance. You have some inheritance due to you. Or a lady has some mahar that is due to her that has not been paid. Not very common in our uh, society, but mahar can be paid over time. It can be uh, delayed. So if that mahar is due to her, <clears throat> a person has some wages that's due to them for the work that they have done. So in that instance, you will not have to pay zakat on that, except if you receive the money and now your zakat date comes and you have it in the form of cash, then you will include it in your zakatable asset calculation. However, if you've already spent it by the time your zakat date comes, there's no zakat that is due on that category of debts. So three categories, sale of trading items, loan of money, loan of gold or silver, zakat is payable every year. Sale of non-trading items, only payable for the year when it has been paid to you. And all other types of debts that are due to you, zakat is not due on them, except if you have the cash in your hands on your particular zakat date. Peace is good, we comfortable? <clears throat> Lots of technical issues, but inshallah, I think we, most of us are, are familiar with these uh, concepts. So, Trade receivables, we've spoken about that, where in our business we have trade receivables. There's a concept of doubtful debts. If you're in business, you have some receivables, but not everybody is going to be paying you. A certain percentage of people may not pay you. So some people have a calculation for doubtful debts. One is you know for sure that person is definitely not going to pay me. He's gone under liquidation or he's come and spoke to me. It's, he's unable to pay. In that case, zakat is not due. But many businesses, they do an estimated calculation, especially the larger businesses. They won't necessarily look at each debtor, but they'll look at it and they will estimate the percentage of debt that, uh, that is not going to come, perhaps 2%, 5%, depending on, on trading history. So they can exclude that from their zakat calculation. However, if they then subsequently recover those debts, bad debts recovered, so obviously the accountants that are uh, here and, and joining this will, will have a better appreciation for this. If that debt is subsequently recovered, then of course, zakat is due on that debt and it would have been due for preceding years as well. So you have doubtful debts and you have bad debts recovered. You need to, in business, make sure that you uh, keep an account of both of those for zakat purposes if you are making use of the concession not to pay zakat on doubtful debts. Then we have prepaid expenses. Sometimes you pay something in advance. <clears throat> you are purchasing something. For example, you're purchasing uh, an aircon. You, you have to put a deposit down before the installation takes place. So it's a prepaid expense. In your financial statements, it will be a prepaid expense. Zakat is not due on that because you are paying it for something that you're going to be receiving in the future. And the ownership of that now will get transferred across to the person that has to deliver the item to you. So prepaid expenses, you would not include in your zakatable calculation. We spoke about deposits, uh, where you have put in a deposit, right? Uh, and we spoke about the fact that, you know, if it's a refundable deposit, you will have to include it in your zakat calculation. Of course, if it's a non-refundable deposit, then it has transferred, the ownership has transferred to the counterparty, and therefore zakat will not be included. Now, many of us, especially if you're renting a property, uh, we have deposits that are put down, we would need to take that into account in our zakatable uh, uh, asset calculation. Sometimes there's a difference of opinion when you put a deposit, for example, for electricity purposes, uh, the municipality, etc. It is better to include that in our zakat calculation. Although there may be differences of opinion that some may argue you don't have uh, full control over that, etc. But where possible, and this is a principle throughout our zakat calculation, we should try and err on the side of caution and where possible rather include something 
then exclude it. Except if a person is in uh, you know, financial difficulty, then consult with the mufti. There are some concessions and in that particular year, uh, perhaps there may be some concession available to you. <clears throat> so this is basically uh, a summary of the uh, assets that uh, so, uh, relate to, to our debtors. Then we come to the investments in our shares. <clears throat> now, when it comes to investments in shares, if you are a share trader, your business is buying and selling shares, and if you're a share trader, you'll know that you're a share trader, then zakat is due on the market value of the shares, the share price on your zakat date. Clear, simple, whatever the share price is on that date, you will include that in your zakat valuation calculation because you are a share trader. If you are, specula if you are a, 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 an investor for capital appreciation, so you're investing in shares for capital appreciation, then there are two options that you have, right? The correct option is that you would need to look at the underlying zakatable assets of the company that you have invested in. Because you are now basically a shareholder in that company. So the debtors, the cash, the stock, less any liabilities, and we'll cover liabilities just now, in that particular company. So if you're able to go down and do that calculation, then you will calculate the zakatable value per share. And you'll see some of our Muslim organizations that have public funds, they will give you on an annual basis a zakatable value per share calculation. So if you own 10 shares, they'll tell you the zakatable value was 10 rands per share, and you'll need to calculate it based on that. Of course, if you have listed investments, it's not always possible for you to get that information yourself. Uh, if you are okay with financial statements, you'll be able to go in and, and do the calculation. Uh, but if you are unable to do that, then you can use the market value as a proxy. So whatever the share price is on that day, you will use that as a proxy for your uh, share price calculation. Of course, if you have an unlisted investment, you have invested in a private entity, uh, you will have to go and look at the underlying zakatable assets that are there and based on your percentage ownership of that, you will have to discharge zakat accordingly, except if that company is discharging zakat on behalf of its shareholders, then they will inform you and they, they will discharge the, the zakat on behalf of their shareholders. We also have something called collective investment schemes. Uh, in, in South Africa, we call them unit trusts. Uh, Overseas in the US, you call them mutual funds. So this is where you invest in a unit trust that is now invested in 40 or 50 different underlying uh, uh, shares. Now, in that situation, it becomes quite cumbersome and difficult for you to go to each underlying share uh, and, and work out the zakatable assets, right? Although with technology, and, and I've had some discussions with the fund managers here in South Africa to encourage them, because nowadays with technology, it is possible. To, to extract that information. But I don't think at, at this point we have that uh, solution in place. So you would have a market value for that unit trust. Uh, for example, if you have, uh, uh, and, and, and we're not talking about the permissibility or impermissibility of these items, of course, you follow the mufti of your choice, but there are those that have allowed permissibility for Sharia compliant unit trusts. A person will get the fund value on their zakat date which is uh, achievable, or sometimes you may not get the exact value, but close enough to that date, uh, the last month end date, or, or whatever it may be, and you will work out the fair value of your portfolio on that date. Okay, then we move into retirement savings, which is similar to uh, the, the share portfolios, but it, it works a little bit differently. Uh, and retirement savings in South Africa are of generally one of two types. You either have a retirement annuity, which you voluntarily contribute to every year or every month, or you have a pension slash provident fund, which is part of the company uh, uh, employment that you have, and they will uh, assist in contributing that to a fund manager. So of course, firstly, we must make sure that if we are investing in these, we look at Sharia compliant alternatives. Uh, a conventional retirement fund, a conventional pension fund would not be permissible because they invest in impermissible assets, in interest bearing assets, etc. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, of course, to understand whether 
we are investing in them as a compulsory act of employment or whether we have done it voluntarily. So sometimes a condition of employment with a particular company or the multinational or corporate is that you have to be part of a pension or provident fund. So if that is the case and it is compulsory, right, then those contributions are compulsory, they are deducted at source and the ulama have mentioned that they are not zakatable. So if it's a compulsory pension fund at your place of employment, you don't have a choice, you have to be part of it. Zakat is not payable because it is deducted at source. However, if it is a voluntary fund, meaning you have a choice, you can choose whether you want to contribute 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, right? Or not contribute at all. Or you privately contribute to a retirement annuity outside of your employer. In that case, that amount is zakatable and the market value on your zakat date is what will be uh, uh, compulsorily zakatable, right? Now, one point of note here is that sometimes you work for a company, you have a compulsory pension or provident fund, so it was not zakatable, and let's say it accumulated to 200,000 rands. When you transfer and you get a job at another company, from a retirement benefit legislation perspective, you have the option at that point to cash out that pension fund or you can transfer it to what they call a preservation fund. Right? If you transfer it to a preservation fund, it is advantageous to you from a tax perspective. If you take it out, you of course will have certain tax consequences. But because you now have the choice, irrespective of the tax consequences, you now have the choice to get Con complete control of these funds, it now comes into your ownership and zakat going forward would be payable on that preservation fund. So this is quite important, especially if you are changing jobs, you have this preservation fund and zakat would be payable on that amount. You might have a situation where you've got company contributions and personal contributions. So if you contribute one rand, and this is more common, uh, particularly in the US where they have the 401k uh, pension funds, where if you contribute one rand, the con company will also contribute one rand, right? So your contribution is voluntary, the company's contribution is seen as a gift, so you would pay on your portion of the contributions, you will not necessarily have to pay on the company's portion of the con contributions, especially if it is deducted at source. Um, in terms of paying this zakat, of course the ideal is to pay it every year, but Essentially, the wealth that you're paying the zakat on, you don't have full access to it at that point in time because it's sitting in that retirement fund. So in that instance, in that instance, ulama have mentioned that you do have the option of delaying the physical payment of zakat until you get the cash payout on retirement. However, you need to make a note of it and accumulate it every year, keep it on your spreadsheet in your records. So when you receive your 10 million rand payout at age 55, you've worked out that I owe one and a half million rands worth of zakat, you will have to discharge that zakat at that point in time, right? I do believe that there's going to be some changes to the retirement uh, uh, fund legislation where you will now have access to retirement funds uh, before the age of 55. Uh, and of course, if that happens, we will have to put that forward to, to the muftis and, you know, it may be a situation where now it's, you are required to pay it every year because you have access to it. But as it stands at this point in time, it is permissible for you to delay that payment till a later date. Okay, now I'm going to go very quickly through cryptocurrency, right? Uh, and I know it's sometimes of interest to people, but the question is, is zakat payable on cryptocurrency or not, right? So the first question is that, do we, from a Sharia perspective, recognize cryptocurrency as a Sharia compliant asset, as a currency? Right? And there's a difference of opinion from the ulama on this. Uh, many have uh, 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 taken the view that it is not uh, considered uh, Sharia compliant, uh, while others have said that it is co uh, considered Sharia compliant. So very briefly, cryptocurrency is a virtual currency where you use cryptography for verification uh, and they use peer-to-peer -peer networks, right? You have something called a coin and you have something called a token, right? Uh, a coin is a unit of value based on blockchain and it's used to exchange. So you can 
use it to trade, whereas a token is a little bit different. Uh, a token entitles you usually to some sort of underlying right. Um, so from a Shari perspective, the question is, is cryptocurrency considered wealth? Is it considered mal? And, and there's a long technical definition of what is mal. Mal from a Shari perspective is uh, ilayhi insan, something that is normally desired by people and it's something that can be stored till a time of need. So something that people have an inclination towards and it can be stored. So because of that, many ulama say that cryptocurrency could be classified as mal. So that's the first question, is it wealth? Some have said yes, some have said no. And beyond that, we have to ask ourselves from a shari perspective, is it considered currency? And in order for it to be Currency from a Shari perspective, it needs to have an independent value, it needs to have a unit of account, and there has to be common usage, ta'amul, right, and mutual concurrence. It has to be something that is widely accepted. And this is generally where those ulama that are of the opinion that it is not a currency, this is where it fails, because not everybody considered that it is widely accepted, particularly from a government perspective, etc. So we're not going to go into the debate there. You can read up on it from a Shari compliance perspective. Of course, if it is not considered mal, no currency, and we're not taking it as Sharia compliant, there'll be no zakat that's due on it, right? If it's considered mal but not currency, as a non-currency, no zakat that's due. But if we consider it as currency and if we are following that view and we're investing in it, right, then there would be zakat that is due on cryptocurrency. So, if, it's got, if, it, if we take the view that it's currency, it's zakatable. If it's not currency, it's not zakatable. That is for the actual coin. When it comes to the tokens, if our intention is to buy and sell tokens, for those who know, they know, right? If you are buying and selling tokens, like goods in trade, it is zakatable because you are buying and selling it. If you are investing in the tokens, you need to look at what those underlying tokens give you access to. Sometimes those tokens give you access on the blockchain uh, or via blockchain uh, to certain rights. If that's the case, they're not zakatable because it's an underlying right. If there is a zakatable underlying asset, whether it's cash, whether it is debt, etc., then of course that token will be zakatable. So if you are investing in cryptocurrency, just to bear in mind, go and do the homework, consult with the ulama, with, with, with the muftis, and find out how to calculate your zakat on cryptocurrency. Okay, now we come to liabilities. What liabilities can we deduct for zakat purposes, right? Any liability that we have incurred to acquire a zakatable asset. For example, we bought goods in our business on credit. So we owe money. We've bought goods, which is a zakatable asset, right? Therefore, we include that and we can deduct that liability. Or we took a loan for our general expenses. We took a loan of cash. We can for our personal needs. We can deduct that from our zakatable assets. In a business, any liabilities that have been incurred for non-zakatable assets. So for example, you incur a liability to purchase a machine. Machine is not zakatable, right? You will not deduct that liability for zakat purposes. This is one view that I'm giving you. There may be other views. You will consult with your mufti, but typically it's a non-zakatable asset. Therefore, that loan that you took out or that financing that you took out to purchase that non-zakatable asset from a business perspective, right, would not be deductible for zakat purposes. However, when it comes to your personal assets, you took out a loan to purchase your house, you took out a loan to purchase your car, the ulama have mentioned that you will not take the full deduction of what you've taken out. So for example, you bought a house for two and a half million rands, you took out a loan. You have committed to pay 10,000 rand per month. The ulama have allowed one year's worth of payments to be deducted as a liability in your personal assets. So in that situation, 120,000 rands, you will deduct one year's worth of payments that you will deduct. Of course, if it is a non-Sharia compliant loan and there's interest involved, you won't be able to deduct the interest. That's not permissible. Only the capital portion can be deducted. But of course, 
that whole transaction is not Sharia compliant to begin with. However, it is a liability, it's a valid liability, therefore the principal amount can be deducted. So when it comes to liabilities, if you've incurred a loan to buy a zakatable asset, the full amount is deductible. In your personal capacity, if you've taken a loan for personal needs, the full amount of the loan is deductible. In your business, if you are buying non-zakatable assets, you should not deduct that loan. And in your personal life, if you are buying non-zakatable assets on a long-term financing, like a vehicle, like a home, etc., then you will be able to deduct a single year's worth of uh, payments in that regard. Okay, <clears throat> when it comes to taxation, many times we know that we have an estimate of tax that we have to pay. So can we deduct that tax liability or not? Right? If that tax liability is an estimate and it has not been assessed by SARS, then the liability has not been established and therefore you should not deduct that from your zakatable assets. If, however, you have filed the tax and between the time of you filing the tax and the time of your payment of that tax, uh, there is a, uh, what do you call it, um, your zakat date comes in, then you can deduct that for zakat purposes. This is for your income taxes. Of course, your VAT, when you collect VAT, you are collecting VAT on behalf of SARS. So your VAT liability can be deducted because that is money that you have to pay across to SARS irrespective of what your filing situation is. If your records are strong enough to be able to calculate that VAT amount that is due, then you will be able to deduct that amount. Okay, when it comes to our zakat rates, now in the beginning of last week's presentation, we spoke about the 2.5% on the lunar calendar, right? But if you are using, especially in a business, the solar calendar or the Gregorian cal calendar, for example, tomorrow is the 28th of February, most of the businesses have that as their financial year end. They'll prepare financial statements and then they will calculate their zakat using the financial statements. So now they are using the Gregorian cal calendar. So you have 365 and a quarter days in the Gregorian calendar, whereas in the lunar calendar, it's 354 days. So we need to adjust the zakat rate when we are using that 2.5%. And the calculation that you would have is that if you are using the Gregorian calendar, you need to pay a little bit extra zakat. If you don't, over a period of between 32 to 33 years, there's a difference between the lunar and the Gregorian calendar where you'll have a whole year that will be lost. And therefore, you lose one year worth of zakat payment. So therefore, the IOFI... Uh, 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 Accounting and Auditing Institution for Islamic Financial Institutions has recommended that we adjust the calculation to 2.577% if you are using your Gregorian calendar, your February year end, for example, or your December year end, you will use a higher zakat rate on your zakatable assets. So this is something important for us to remember. We spoke about agricultural products and just for information purposes, this is part of our deen and it's something that we, we, must, we must learn about even if we don't if we're not farmers or, uh, you know, agricultural moguls in our own right. But this is part of our deen. Uh, on agricultural produce, you will pay 10% for non-irrigated lands and 5% for produce of irrigated lands. And obviously in between 7.5% if it's partially irrigated. And when it comes to animals, you will also have, uh, there are predetermined zakat tables for different types of animals, whether it's sheep, whether it's, camels, whether it's cows, uh, the type of camels that you have, there's predetermined uh, 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 calculations or, 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 or tables that determine how much of zakat you will have to give. Okay, so now we come, inshallah, for the last portion of our uh, presentation. We've got two worked examples to be able to test your knowledge and see whether you've been paying attention over the last two hours or, or whether we've been having a good sleep and... Uh, Inshallah, if we, if we get all the answers right, then we can leave. If we don't get the answers right, then we need to start the presentation all over again. So the first example, right? Here we are looking at a situation whereby when is a person liable for zakat? So here's the example. 
Zaid began working on the first of Sha'ban, 1433. So I've kept it as, as the lunar calendar. And he received his first salary of 50,000 rand on the first of Ramadan, 1433. Prior to this, Zaid had only had cash in his account of 4,200 rand. And he had no other assets or liabilities except his personal effects. So for South African purposes, the nisab for zakat is about 8,600 rand. So prior to this, Zaid was not zakatable because he did not have more than 8,600 rand in his account. Now we've got different scenarios. On the 1st of Ramadan, 1444, one year later, so we started out, sorry, that should have been 1443, not 1433, 1443. One year later, we've got different scenarios. Scenario A, Zaid has got 55,000 rand in his bank account. And throughout the entire year, his wealth remained above Nisab, of above 8,500 rands. Scenario number one. Scenario number two, in one year, he only has 3,100 rand in his account. But throughout the year, he had more than the Nisab amount, more than 8,600 rand in his account. But on that one year anniversary, whatever it is, he had to pay something. And he now is gone down to 3,100 rand. Scenario number C, he is in debt of 15,000 rand. He has no money, but he owes somebody 15,000 rand. And scenario number four, he has got 25,000 rands, but he lost all his wealth midway through the year. Right? So these are four scenarios. So first scenario, 55,000 rand, his wealth has remained above Nisab throughout the year. Is he zakatable or not? He's zakatable. And what value? The full value, right? So in the first scenario, Zaid will have to pay 2.5% of 55,000 rand, which is 1,375 rands, because he had Nisab on the 1st of Ramadan, 1443. One year passed over his wealth. He still has Nisab, and he has more than that. Whatever he has, he has to pay Zakat on it. Scenario number two, he had Nisab at the beginning of the year. So now his calculation started. His one year started. But one year later... On that date, he has less than the nisab, so now he does not have to pay zakat. He still, every now he has to continue calculating on his zakat date. His zakat date is now the first of Ramadan, because one year passed. But he does not have nisab on that date, therefore he will not have to pay zakat. He will have to look at it in the following year. Scenario 3, of course, Zaid is in debt. He has no funds. So in that case, he will not be uh, required to pay any zakat. And the last one, although one year later, Zaid has more than Nisab. He had Nisab in the beginning of the year. He has Nisab at the end of the year. But because during the year he lost all his wealth, he dipped to zero. The moment you dip to zero, your calculation, your annual calculation needs to start again. Right? So it's the only scenario where if you go to zero, your calculation will start again. So some way midway through the year, he got his Nisab wealth again, so he'd start his calculation, perhaps may have been, you know, Rajab may have been, wherever in between, he will restart his calculation. All clear on that. All right. So that was the first example. Last example, or, or second example, Amr possesses the Nisab on the first of Ramadan. So he's Zakatable, and he has the following assets and liabilities. 30,000 rand of hard cash under his mattress, 25,000 rand in his bank account, and $1,200 in his global FNB Forex account. He also has one Kruger coin. He has two gold bangles weighing 20 grams. He loaned his friend 25,000 rand. It's going to be paid in six months. And he's renting his house, so he also has a 10,000 rand deposit on his house. During this time, he purchased his first house. He hasn't moved in yet. He's bought it, so he's still renting on the other side. And he took a loan of 2 million rand from his father to pay this Sharia-compliant loan. And he's paying this loan in monthly installments of 15,000 rand per month. So he's still staying in his rented house, but he's also bought a house, and he's now owing his father 15,000 rand a month for this house. He's also a member of a retirement fund as part of his employment. It's a compulsory fund, and the value on the 1st of Ramadan is 300,000 rands. I hope... The bells are uh, ringing now as we're going through the examples, right? 
Amar's mother also recently passed away and his share of the inheritance that is being now wound up by the executor is going to be 250,000 rand and it will be paid within the next month. And on the side, Amar has a side hustle. He sells iPhones and on the first of Ramadan, he's got 10 iPhones in stock. He bought them at 15,000 rand each. He's going to be selling them to the brothers in the masjid at 25,000 rand each. If he had to sell the whole parcel, the whole parcel to a parcel trader, he would sell it at 20,000 rand each or 200,000 rand. Right? So let's calculate Zaid's uh, or Amar's uh, zakat liability. So first one, 30,000 rand of hard cash in his bank account. We include that. We add the 25,000 rand in his bank account. And the $1,200, we will work out the rand dollar exchange rate, which I was very surprised to see, 18 rand 42, very depressing uh, rand dollar exchange rate. Uh, all our zakat uh, values are going to go up this year, alhamdulillah, compared to last year. So translated into rands, it's 22,104 rands. Remember, he can pay that in dollars if he wants to, if he has the ability to do that. So his hard cash is 77,104 rands. He'll put that into his calculation. Looking at his gold, he has a Kruger coin. We looked at the market value, it's 36,200. And he's got 20 grams of gold. The gram value of gold is $58.74 per gram. You could also get it in ounces and you could translate, right? And again, we look at the exchange rate of 18 rand 42 to the dollar. So the gold value is 21,640 rand. So his gold value is 57,840 rand on his zakat date. The loan that he's given to his friend, because it was given in cash, we therefore have to include it in his zakat calculation. And he also has a refundable deposit on his rental, which also has to be included in his zakat calculation. And therefore his debtors is at 35,000 rands. Now, can he deduct the liability? that he has for the, the, the home that he has purchased. He can't deduct the full two and a half million, two million rands to his father, but he can deduct the first 12 months of installment or 12 months worth of installments, 15,000 rand times 12, and therefore he can deduct 180,000 rands. Now, I just want to point out here, if you have financing with an Islamic bank and it's a musharaka financing, this calculation as we do it here, 12 times the installment will not work because of the structure of the musharaka and what your liability actually is. So anybody who has that can have that conversation with me uh, later on. But just want to highlight to you that it's not a simple case of 12 times the installment. This is where you owe the 15,000 rand as a uh, committed loan. You will be able to uh, deduct that. Okay, in terms of his inventory, he's got these 10 iPhones and we said the bulk sale price at 20,000 Rand each. So he doesn't have to go at 25,000, he can go at 20,000, but he can't go at the cost price. He has to go at the bulk sale price of 200,000 Rand for his inventory. What assets will we exclude? We'll exclude that debt that is due from his mother's estate because it's in the third category of debtors. It's not uh, uh, required for him to include that in his zakat calculation and he hasn't been paid it out in cash at this point in time. And he has a retirement fund, but it's a compulsory retirement fund. It's deducted at source. Therefore, we will not include the value of the retirement fund. So there are his assets, cash, gold, debtors, inventory comes to a total of 369,000 rand. We deduct his liability of 180,000 rands and therefore we work out his zakatable assets to be 189,000 rands. That's his net zakatable assets. Multiply that by 2.5% and his zakat liability today is 4,748 rands, which he has to discharge at this point in time. So this is how we would calculate uh, Amar's uh, zakat liability. In terms of looking at online calculators uh, or online resources, I'll just share with you uh, I have found personally, from a fatwa perspective, if you're looking for different scenarios that are well explained, uh, just to, you know, if you have some questions in your mind, of course, the askimam.org uh, uh, website, uh, the, the website of our Ustad, Hazrat Mufti Ibrahim Desai, Rahmatullahi Ali, is one of the best resources because it's got a whole lot of uh, uh, a bank of questions that you can Google and, and, and check for, for your situation. But 
always best to check with an alim after you have uh, uh, done that research. Also, the uh, Darul Ifta in Azadwal has got a very good website with good resources and questions, good contemporary questions, very well clearly explained. Ifta D U A. Uh, it's either .co.za or .org.za, but if you if you Google the Darul Ifta in Azadwal, they also have quite a good bank of questions uh, on zakat. In terms of online zakat calculators, there are many different ones. One that I have personally found to be quite useful online that doesn't require you to download it and also has some basic explanations uh, for the Hanafi Mazhab is uh, a, a calculator that you will find on Seekers Guidance. Seekersguidance.org. It's a Canadian website. Very user-friendly zakat calculator and it has some explanations for the different categories. It's got some worked examples there as well, but it's quite a nice uh, 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 functionality. I'm not talking about you know, the, the organization or promoting the organization, but simply looking at the functionality of that particular uh, uh, calculator, seekersguidance.org. You can have a look at that if you are looking for an online calculator. Alternately, as, as I showed you, you know, we can uh, uh, you do your own calculation, whether it be on Excel or Google Docs or in, even in, in a handwritten format. So inshallah, that brings us to the end of our zakat presentation. Uh, we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from us, gives us the correct understanding. Uh, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, birahmatika ya rahman rahimin.